USS Indianapolis was a Portland-class cruiser, which meant that she was part of the first class of US heavy cruisers to actually carry armour worth considering in an engagement that involved 8-inch gunfire. Uh, they built on the experience gained from the preceding Pensacola and Northampton classes to deliver a ship capable of around 33 knots, armed with a main battery of three triple 8-inch turrets for a total of nine guns, the last cruiser designed to use the rectangular profile turrets common in 1920s US Navy thinking. Along with a dedicated anti-aircraft battery of eight single 5-inch 25 calibre guns and a couple of 47mm weapons, mainly used for saluting. In keeping with US cruiser design of this period, no torpedoes would be fitted. Up to 5 inches of belt and 2.5 and inches of deck armour gave the ship surprisingly good protection where the armour existed, given that the ships came in at under the treaty limits, without any creative accounting for displacement. A number of aircraft could be carried, and new shells meant that they could also reach out further than their predecessors, and as such they would be fitted out as flagships. All in all, the two ships, Portland and Indianapolis, were a rather prestigious pair for the time. Indianapolis was laid down in March 1930, launched in November 1931, and commissioned exactly a year later, almost, in 1932, starting life in the Atlantic. But by the end of 1933 she transited to the Pacific, where she would remain for the bulk of her pre-war career. Due to being on a training exercise, Indianapolis was at sea during the attack on Pearl Harbor, and thus was one of the first ships operational for one of the first counter-strike missions, escorting first USS Lexington, which was then later joined by USS Yorktown, although her pre-war activities combined with the sudden hard steaming to and fro meant that she was recalled for a refit before long, resulting in her missing out on the battles of Coral Sea and Midway, before being assigned to convoy escort duty briefly, and then taking a leading role in the successful retaking of the Aleutian Islands, which had briefly fallen to the Japanese as part of a diversionary effort that was meant to distract the US Navy from Midway. This campaign would take around about a year, ending with the quote-unquote invasion of an abandoned island as the Japanese had given up all pretense at actually trying to hold on to it, with a highlight for the ship in this particular campaign being the sinking of a Japanese supply ship carrying a wide mix of items, but including a large amount of ammunition, which promptly detonated, reducing the ship to confetti and bad memories. After a brief refit in summer 1943, it was then on to join the main invasion effort, with the assault on Tarawa. As with many other American ships in this time period, this meant a lot of shore bombardment duty, and supporting carrier expeditions in order to launch raiding strikes against Japanese targets that were further forward than the main line of advance. This would include attacks on the Western Caroline Islands and the Mariana Islands, along with a minor role in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, before heading onwards to take Guam and the surrounding islands, before heading back to California for yet another refit by the end of 1944. US cruisers that survived this far into the war were getting very heavily used. She was back in action by February 1945, taking part in raids launched against the Japanese home islands themselves, with Indianapolis acting in escort support. By this point she was carrying multiple radars, two dozen 40mm Bofors, and 19 single 20mm Orlikans, along with her 5-inch anti-aircraft guns, making her a very powerful anti-aircraft escort to the carriers. After a number of such raids, the ship found itself back on shore bombardment duty, this time off of Okinawa, where she was hit by a kamikaze and the bomb it was carrying, in separate locations. This would bring her back to Mare Island for yet another visit. One wonders if there was perhaps a frequent visitor point system for this particular shipyard for the poor old cruiser. But with those repairs completed, she was tasked with an especially secret mission to take atomic bomb components and a good chunk of the world's total supply of weapons-grade uranium to the other side of the Pacific, where it would be assembled into the bomb that would later be dropped on Hiroshima. Travelling alone at top speed via Pearl Harbor, she managed the crossing in only ten days before being reassigned to more mundane duties. Heading to join other US ships off the Philippines, she would be hit just after midnight on the 30th of July by two torpedoes from the submarine I-58. 
These Type 95 weapons were the submarine version of the feared Long Lance, and with over 50% of her underwater compartments instantly compromised by the twin blasts, she capsized and sank in less than 15 minutes. Albeit that for such a rapid sinking, the majority of her crew actually managed to get out, with about 75% of the 1,195 aboard getting into the water. Albeit that the speed of the evacuation and the rate of capsizing meant that there weren't that many boats or floats available, as it had been impossible to launch them in time. The ship's radio officers had managed to get distress calls off, but due to a combination of paranoia, negligence, and outright laziness, various operating stations that received these signals didn't acknowledge or forward them. There was further dereliction of duty that meant that no search was launched when the ship was reported overdue either, and so the approximately 900 survivors had to endure three to four days at sea with dehydration, hypothermia, poisoning from bunker oil, and of course the famous, but possibly later slightly over-exaggerated by the media, shark attacks, which whittled the numbers down to just over 300 by the time a Catalina flying boat happened to chance across them. Once found, there was a combination of heroic efforts by various flying boats and surface ships that managed to rescue most of those who were still left alive but it was too late for many who had survived the sinking of the ship itself. Following this, Captain McVeigh became the only US captain court-martialed for the loss of his ship in World War II, although the circumstances of the trial were so contrived that despite being found guilty of risking the ship, the sentence was almost immediately retracted by Fleet Admiral Nimitz, and there was a much later investigation, starting in the late 1990s, that would eventually result in the clearing of McVeigh's name completely. But this ship's particular story will have to be explored in more detail at some point in the future to go over the full circumstances of her loss. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.